So welcome everybody. Today's um, webinar is focused on professional services firm and um, we're from BDO. Um, my name is Anna Gerald and I am the tax partner leading our professional services tax team in the UK. I know I know lots of you already. Um, so for those of you who don't know me or the firm, so BDO is a global accounting network with over 11 billion US dollars of revenues. And we provide all sorts of services, including auditing, accounting and taxation services. We're pretty much everywhere in the world, covering 167 countries, and we've got over 97,000 people. So we're going to focus on VAT today, and we'll give an update on both UK and international VAT matters. But before I introduce our speaker, I do want to acknowledge that there is a lot going on in the world right now. And our thoughts are with all of the people being impacted by that. Personally, I can't even begin to imagine the circumstances that people find themselves in. But I know we have to plough on and we said we were going to do a VAT webinar and we're going to. So our speaker today is a DT Hyatt and um, I'm really grateful to a DT actually because she stepped in last minute to cover for Ishvinda Bedi. And many of you have probably worked with both Ish and a DT before. So both are really well versed in VAT matters impacting professional services firms. And Aditi has got over 14 years of experience of advising clients on international and UK VAT matters. And Aditi has advised businesses through a huge range of different issues. I've asked her lots of questions in the past, including whether you know, VAT is due on an income stream, um, what's going on with partial exemptions for some of my clients, and all sorts of cross-border complex transactions. So Aditi also has a number of sort of international VAT projects that she's involved in, um, delivering across overseas VAT advice across multiple jurisdictions. So as I say, we're gonna do an update on VAT matters, UK and international, and we're gonna cover some case law. So cases will include those that are up on the screen, so Graham Farrett International, LLP, Mandarin Consulting, et cetera. And we're also gonna be picking up on HMRC updates specifically around compensation payments and liquidation damages, making tax digital, and also uncertain tax treatments, which of course has much broader um, issues rather than just VAT. So we do want you to ask questions to make it as interactive as possible. So please pop your questions into the Q&A feature. I think that's either at the top or at the bottom of your screen. And we'll pick up as many of these as we go along at the end of the seminar, if, um, if time doesn't permit, and after the session. So we, we, as always, we're recording the webinar and we'll email a slide deck as well as a recording in a few days' time. Um, we'll make sure we finish within the hour. And so I will now hand over to Aditi. Thank you so much, Ajana, and a very warm welcome to all. Because we have a very um, a large agenda and an hour. I want to go straight into the content. Um, just want to say, guys, if you have any questions, just feel free to put them into Q&A and we can pick them up as long as we go. Firstly, Hotel Latour. So this has been one of the cases that has been huge in, in the VAT world. And if you speak with a VAT specialist, uh, you know, more often than not, you'll probably hear them talking about this case. Why is this case important? It is important because traditionally, when an entity is selling shares in another entity to a UK buyer, that kind of share sale is considered VAT exempt, which means that businesses looking to exit or making disposals they usually struggle to recover VAT on its cost. This case, particularly Hotel Latour, has brought to forefront that very same discussion that if you are selling shares, it doesn't automatically mean that you can't recover VAT on your cost. It all depends on what your costs are and how are they being used effectively for, for business purpose. So in Hotel Latour, the holding company sold shares in its subsidiary to a local UK buyer. What it did with the sale proceeds was it invested the sale proceeds in running another hotel, which was a fully taxable business. Hotel Latour managed 
to successfully convince the first year tribunal that although the costs were incurred in the context of share sales, they have a wider benefit for the business because when the shares were sold, the sale proceeds were used for conducting further taxable activities. And in this case, it was effectively running a hotel business, opening a new hotel. The first year tribunal said in that kind of scenario, because there is a link between the cost that was incurred and the onward taxable activity, um, the, the, the taxpayer hotel tour can actually get VAT recovery back on its cost. Um, there is an exception, if, and it's a very long decision for someone who is brave enough to read, uh, read, read it. Um, but there is an exception in that particular case, which says that if the cost that you have incurred form cost component of the share sale, and it doesn't form a cost component of a business overhead, then in that situation, the standard rule does apply, which means you don't get back recovery back on your call. Now, as you can imagine, this has created a, a lot of questions and a lot of opportunities for businesses, mainly because it shifted the thinking that share disposal costs does not automatically mean that you can't recover it. You can potentially recover it. The second thing to think about is HMRC naturally obviously don't like the decision at all. And in fact, they have appealed to the upper tribunal. In the meantime, um, it's important for businesses, whoever are in, in a similar situation, so it's thinking about in what context can you apply the, the hotel to a decision in your case. And just being mindful of the fact that this is still a lower tier tribunal decision, it's possible that an upper tribunal may perhaps come to an opposite view. So it's just keeping that in mind, but also making sure that the business can make decisions um, which protects themselves and helps maximize opportunities that are arising from this particular decision. Um, can I just ask you a question just uh, also you do for me you're fading in and out a little bit in terms of the volume so I don't know if you can move a bit closer I know you've got a new laptop today so it, it may be something to do with the technology so apologies um, if other people are having difficulties just hearing elements of what you're saying but um, if you're a professional services firm and you're looking at this result you know obviously businesses often will be selling shares and um, particularly in, in recent years when there's been explosion of sort of additional things that professional services firms have, have invested in what should be they, they be really thinking about as a result of this case um so firstly Anna, is this is this voice better um is is this it's fading in and out so i suspect it's not you but we'll go with it I will I will try and keep closer to my laptop and um, I'll speak a bit more slowly so hopefully people people can catch it. But to address your question, Anna, so businesses in a in in particularly in the professional services world should effectively look at two things. First is assess have they sold shares in the past, particularly in the last four years, and how have they treated their share disposal costs for VAT purposes. It's looking at its historic position and assessing after the hotel ladder to a decision, is there now an opportunity to claim back VAT from HMRC where they haven't? And it's looking through the detail in terms of identifying hotel ladder succeeded because they could show there was a link to taxable activity. So the challenge would be for businesses is to identify how can they show their link in, in these kind of circumstances for the past. There's also a piece around looking at the future and determining when you are looking to make any further share sales or further exits. It's worth taking a pause and asking yourself, what can I do better now to help me get the most or maximize my chance? of recovering VAT on, on the transaction. So it might be that um, 
there might be additional documents um, or there would be things that you would structure differently. So it's worth asking those questions, particularly for future purposes. Got it. Okay, so you've got to look back four year window and actually you know obviously time ticks on so things will be falling out of that four year window so it's worth sort of picking up the phone if there are in that situation yep. and then also being prepared for the future events to make sure that you're in the best place that you can be I, yeah and the thing is because hmrc have appealed to the upper tribunal it's still possible that the litigation would be ongoing but if businesses don't take action now for the last four years, like you said, the clock ran out of time limits. So it's best to do something now. Put your claim on file so at least it can get resolved once the wider litigation is resolved. Correct. Thank you. Um, we would now move on to the next slide, please. So Gray and Farah International LLP. So this is a decision focusing on consulting services. And essentially this taxpayer provided matchmaking services. And as you will see from the slide, the taxpayer effectively, it wasn't just simply providing introductions. They would assess their client's needs, their wants, desires, and they would then identify potential matches. And as part of that, they would advise the client in, in terms of um, the, the post introduction and just helping them and coaching them. The first year tribunal effectively was asked to consider whether the matchmaking services fall as consultancy services. And the reason this is important is because if the service was a consultancy service, if it is provided to somebody outside the EU uh, pre-Brexit and post, uh, outside the UK post-Brexit, these are considered to be vaccine. So it was very important for the taxpayer to demonstrate that this is a consultancy service. The first year tribunal, when it first looked at the matchmaking supply, they concluded that the service is very complex. So it's not only including consultancy, but it's including other services on post-introduction uh, liaison. So that includes things like um, follow-up with um, your client, advising them on you know, things they could do better and just generally supporting them in terms of confidence and um, life coaching effectively. And the first year said that is beyond consulting and um, therefore, the taxpayer should always charge VAT. The upper tribunal, interestingly, came to a, a different conclusion. So they basically said that, yes, although there, there are other services that the taxpayer is providing, if you look at what the customer is getting, the customer is getting a service of matchmaking and from a customer's perspective, a matchmaking who is mainly providing consultancy service and providing information, both of those elements help the client um, effectively to demonstrate they could rely on, on the rule I just described. And under that rule, the upper tribunal basically said, actually, you know, the taxpayer should be able to treat its services to overseas customers at spat free. Um, the important thing here, if we go to the next slide, uh, thank you. The important thing here is that uh, in many ways, it's interesting how different courts have come to slightly different conclusions based on the same fact pattern. The fact pattern was it's a matchmaking service, but that matchmaking service had different components to it. The first year tribunal said it's not consultancy. The upper tribunal said actually it is consultancy and it, it effectively, and, the, and if you look through the detail of the decision, the reason why the upper tribunal came to the view that it did was because of two things. First is the documentation that the taxpayer had collated and could demonstrate exactly in terms of what information are they providing, what kind of consultancy services they're providing. 
The second was being able to demonstrate what what is the customer getting, what is uh, what is important to the customer, and the the consistent evidence that was coming up was the customer was getting a service which was consultancy and information. So this helped the taxpayer finally get through the hurdle and treat uh, treated services as um, outside the scope of VAT, particularly when they're working with overseas customers. As you will see from the slide, HMRC are obviously not very happy with it, so they have sought permission to appeal. This is not the last word in, um, in, 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 in this litigation, but um, yeah, it would be interesting to see what the Court of Appeal decides. Um, but again, this case is helpful for professional businesses because it showcases a, you know, consultancy doesn't have to be the traditional forms of consultancy services. It could cover a wide range of other things, including matchmaking. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So this is, um, as you will see, another consulting um, services firm. This one's Mandarin Consulting. And the question here posed was slightly different. So this entity was providing career coaching to uh, in students, effectively, mainly from the Chinese, uh, from China, and uh, basically to help them um, assess their um, requirements in the UK in terms of what studies to pursue, what careers to pursue, and what sort of things the students should think about to help improve their chances of, of studying and living in the UK. The, the question in this case was effectively to whom was the um, taxpayer providing services? And the second was can the taxpayer demonstrate where the customer was located? Now, in, in terms of the to whom the services were provided, initially Mandarin provided and engaged with the students and there was a question around, well, where do you consider the students to be located? Do you consider them to be located overseas where they usually live in China or should you be considering looking at the residency of the individual when they are in the UK? Because a lot of them have visas to, to remain in the UK. So one of the things the court considered was that when you look at the um, residency of an individual, you have to follow the rules. And you'll see a lot of legislative references on your slide, particularly Article 23. The reason that reference is important is because it sets out the rules in terms of how you go about identifying the location of your customer. And this is particularly in situations where these are not businesses, so you're looking at individuals. And the kind of things you look at is where is the usual residence? Where are the individual's occupational ties, personal ties? And it's using that kind of evidence to decide where that individual is effectively located. Now, Mandarin, sadly, did not have proper evidence or documentation in terms of where the customer lo was located. So effectively, the court said, well, you can, the, legis the legislation here gives you a set of things for you to think about when selecting evidence. But it doesn't mean that if you find evidence which is outside this leg legislation, but it still helps you prove where your customer is located, you can still rely on that alternative evidence to effectively determine the VAT treatment. The other thing the court interestingly said was, you don't have to have evidence at the time you have made that supply. So for example, if you have provided coaching to a student, another time there was doubt on the VAT treatment, you charge VAT. Later on, you further evidence came to light, which suggested actually the student who is not in the UK, so they were overseas. That later evidence can still be relied on by the taxpayer to say actually the supply should have been VAT free. 
the main thing uh, the upper tribunal emphasized was that even though the taxpayer can rely on evidence that was collated later, it should be contemporaneous. So it means, I mean, it, it, it basically, you need to collect evidence that showed that at the time you made the supply, the customer was overseas, even if that evidence was collected later. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So effectively, what the decision is basically saying is best case scenario, make sure you collect evidence as is required by the legislation. It's not the end of the world if you can't find everything that the legislation requires, but you have collected sufficient alternative evidence to support your uh, the fact that the individual is located overseas. The third thing is you can still rely on evidence that was collated later but the important thing is that the evidence still should show that at the time you made the supply the individual was overseas so lots to think about but practically it's worth as uh, particularly professional services firms when you're working with individuals and you can't find only all the documentary evidence to determine location of the customer it's worth thinking about this case because it is giving some form of leeway to taxpayers to say well it is still possible for you to rely on evidence you've collected later so long as it shows that at the time you made the supply they were overseas. so it's it's worth thinking about how this could help your business All right thank you Should we move on to the next slide? Perfect. Uh, Regency factoring. Now, this is an interesting decision. So, effectively, it's a case on bad debt relief. And as many businesses know, if you supply services and if you don't get paid, you have the option to claim back the VAT that you had accounted for originally on the supply. Now, obviously, because it's a bad debt relief, HMRC and the legislation both, they have set out very specific conditions in terms of how you can obtain that relief. Now, this particular taxpayer is a factoring business and they sought a bad debt relief in terms of um, the services that they had provided. There were two things um, that the court was asked to look at. First is was there a bad debt? The second is, well, if there's a bad debt, did the taxpayer meet the record keeping conditions? You see from the Court of Appeal decision, effectively, the first year tribunal said, actually, there, there is no bad debt, and B, there was no proper record keeping. And you'll see that when the Court of Appeal, when they looked at this case, they didn't focus on the first question of whether there is a bad debt or not, um, but they focused on the record keeping. And they concluded that because this taxpayer had um, did not strictly follow the rules of record keeping that are set out for bad debt relief, um, it was very difficult for anybody to show how much uh, bad debt has the taxpayer actually incurred and how much relief was available. So the court basically say, said, you didn't follow the rules, basically. The rules say, this is how you need to keep your records. Uh, Regency factoring, you haven't done that, so you can't have your relief back, um, which is a shame because if they did have proper record keeping, then um, there is still a question of whether the Court of Appeal would have found in favor of them because there is a wider question of whether they incurred a bad debt. And you'll see the Court of Appeal ducked that question. Um, but I'll, I'll briefly mention that question anyway, um, just, just, just so you have it in mind why, why it was interesting. And it was because the taxpayer provided factoring services. It invoiced its client for its services. But what it did was instead of 
um, the 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 money that um, the sub original supplier had sold for it effectively deducted its commission and only passed on a net amount to the supplier uh, or to the original to its customer who had sought factoring services. So HMRC's view was that because you didn't pass on 100% of the amount, you just you deducted a commission, you effectively got paid for the service. Um, we never know um, at the mo at this stage, um, at least based on this case, what the Court of Appeals could have concluded, whether it was a bad debt or not. But um, yeah, it the, the learning point is record keeping. It's best to follow the rules and make sure that you have proper de documentation to demonstrate that because it can make or break a taxpayer's case. Yeah, so even though this is a particular niche to focus and question around debt factoring, the, th the theory of making sure that the, the documentation and that the rules are being followed is the thing to take away for the audience. Absolutely, Anna. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? Perfect. Now, this is this is a case that has an impact to everybody who runs employee reward schemes. Now, I must highlight that at this moment, this case is an opinion from the Advocate General. So it's not a decision at all. So it's not binding on anybody but it gives you a flavor in terms of what the um, European court is currently thinking and where the decision could possibly go. Um, the facts of this case are that the taxpayer effect effectively ran an employee reward scheme. So they allowed their employees to nominate other employees who've done really well and nominate them. Um, if they were successful, they would get a voucher, which could then be redeemed um, across different suppliers for um, all sorts of things, restaurants, um, you know, whatever they wanted. They, you know, they could just go on a website and download a voucher and redeem it. The question was that when the employer gave that free voucher to the employee, is that subject to reading or not? The Advocate General said, starting point, when you are giving a free voucher to an employee, it is a free service. And because it's a free service, standard rule is that VAT should apply. But she goes on to then carry her own decision because she says that if that standard rule was followed in this situation, what would happen is double taxation. This is because the employer would charge VAT on the voucher. Then when the employee redeems that voucher, say it goes to a restaurant, buy some nice food shoes, then the retailer would also account for VAT on, on, on the supplies that are being made. So effectively, there's double taxation. So one of the things the Advocate General said is in that kind of scenario, particularly where the employer doesn't know the, how the voucher is going to be used particularly. Um, for example, is it going to be for a restaurant? Is it going to be for um, shoes? It could be for any, if, if there is no knowledge and no control from the employer in terms of how the voucher is going to be used, then they shouldn't have to charge VAT. So you can see that, um, again, the court effectively and when I say code, it means the advocate general, she's agreed with the taxpayer in saying, uh, don't charge any VAT at all. But the analysis is very long um, and complicated. And it's more complicated because there are vouchers involved. And um, for those who are familiar with the voucher rules, you do sometimes need a cold towel on the head uh, to um, determine the VAT treatment. But one of the key things um, the Advocate General said was when you're looking at a free service and whether that should be subject to VAT or not, it's important to make sure that there are two conditions and those are on your slide. Um, it's important that those two conditions um, 
are not are, are effectively if they are met then there is no supply um and if they are not met then there, there there is a supply and those conditions are that as an employer you can show there's a link between the free service and the taxable activity of the employer and the second is if the taxpayer can also show there is control in terms of how the free service is being used in those kind of situations the advocate general considered that um, you shouldn't have to charge rating but obviously in in this situation because the employer had no control over how the voucher could be used um it it naturally decided standard rule you should charge back but because this is vouchers and it um it could lead to double taxation how you was you shouldn't have to charge in the end anyway my takeaway point is worth having a look at your own reward schemes and checking how you are treating these for VAT purposes um the rules for uh, vouchers they are complicated and they have been through a few changes or at least over the last decade and the most recent one being a few years old now and with this case particularly when the judgment does come out is worth taking stock and determining whether there is an any opportunity um to make sure that the you know the business is following the vat treatment appropriately and um is it necessarily uh, opening any unnecessary tax burden If we can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Claims handling. Okay, so this one is um, a case at the European Court, and effectively, the taxpayer provided a range of complex services. So they designed an insurance product which they sold to the insurance company, and if the insurance company wanted. they also helped the insurance company with finding potential customers and then uh binding the potential customers under the insurance contract and managing the onward uh insurance administration so particularly claims handling the court was asked to consider whether the service provided by the taxpayer was it back exempt as an ins- as an insurance service the court interestingly said actually the service provided by the taxpayer is a taxable supply and the reason for that is because the taxpayer didn't provide insurance intermediation so the main service was designing an insurance product and licensing that insurance product to an insurer the fact that the insurer then asked the provider the taxpayer to do other things which on its own could potentially be insurance intermediary and vat exempt the court thought that was minor and ancillary to the main part of licensing a product so in in that sort of situation the court said it is taxable and again this case again brings the home to light is that when you're looking at the vat treatment it's worth looking at hey what you're providing how is that documented what is the customer thinking from uh, and what is the customer thinking they're buying from you because all these sort of questions will help to determine the vat treatment of your supply if we can move on to the next slide please okay so this one is uh, for i mean i'm sure you all would have come across a misselling of ppi claims so this was the um some years ago where um uh, you know lo- lots of businesses had to uh, pay heavy money out um for misselling products so claims advisory helped its clients with making ppi claims so what they would do is um speak with their clients work with them to identify if they have a claim and if they do have a claim they would then um help them get some money back and they were their uh, fees were success fee so they would take a cut of whatever uh, compensation was being provided to effectively to to the policy holder the, the company argued that the service it was providing 
वो इज इफेक्टिवली एग्जेम्ड फॉर वैट पर्पजेज दिस वॉज बिकॉज दे वॉज सप्लाइंग एधर इंश्योरेंस और एन इंश्योरेंस रिलेटेड ट्रांजेक्शन ना the upper tribunal basically said no to both questions and whoever has fancy is reading um or you know exploring what an insurance transaction is or what an insurance related transaction is it's a good case to start because it covers a lot of important case law in that area and it also gives its own twist and its own views on that but put simply the court said that what the company is doing is far remote from an insurance transaction the reason for that is because the company was not involved in um arranging the original cpi policy they had no knowledge and no relationship with the insurer or the insured when the policy was originally formed and the service they are providing is more administrative in nature so they are helping make compensation arising from an insurance policy rather than um me helping them make claims under that policy so the court basically said that the kind of work they're doing it's not connected at all um and for that reason the service should be taxable again it comes down to the nature of the service and how it's worded um that has helped um you know dictate the vat treatment so this is another classic case that determines that if we can move to the next slide please perfect so this is another a huge topic in the vat world and it is relevant for all sorts of businesses so effectively um and i'll 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 it's i'll take you through a history originally but say if we were speaking say 6 7 years ago or even 10 years back um the traditional view was compensation um at vat free so you don't pay any vat on compensation um but over a period of time and with the case law that arrived things have changed and it must be have introduced new policy and under that new policy and this takes effect uh from 1st april and when i say new it it must be have put a new ans to that so they said that this was always a policy but we want to make sure that businesses um follow the policy from 1st april 2022 and we want to clarify what a policy is and their policy effectively is that most payments that businesses uh, receive for terminating a contract early or if they receive compensation most payments um, that they receive from cust- customers for such kind of payments they are considered to be taxable for vat purposes so vat should apply however in certain instances they are willing to accept that no vat apply so those instances include situations where there are dilapidation payments or instances where there there are charges that the supplier made which are clearly punitive and it's intended to penalize a customer for breaking or breaching a contract rather than an additional payment for services so it's again um one of the areas where there has been a lot of debate in terms of whether a payment that you receive from a customer either for varying terms of contract or leaving a contract early um are they still subject to vat or not it must be starting point is yes it is subject to vat but there might be very limited instances where they would still accept things to be vat free um one of hmrc's concern has been on value shifting so they have particularly for dilapidation they have stated that they would view such payments more closely so although they would accept their dilapidation are vat free they would look at whether any there has been any special arrangement between the tenant and the landlord where the value of the rent has been suppressed 
so that the dilapidation uh, payments have increased um, and which are batch free. So HMRC basically said we look at each each payment on a case by case basis. Um, but the main thing they would be looking at is effectively two things. Have you received a payment and what is it for? And is there a link between um, what the payment is and what the supply is? If there is a proper link, you're in the uh, territory of taxation. If there's no proper link, then there are more grounds to argue uh, it's bad fee. Again, seek advice um, if if you have done and also make sure that if you do have or in the future you're receiving such payments, it's worth uh, reviewing how you should treat them for VAT purposes. And one thing HMRC have said is if we have given you a ruling before that a payment is VAT free, ignore that ruling. So the policy takes uh, precedence over any rulings they have given in the past. Okay, so there's some really important points in here. And I know that this has been under s scrutiny for some time. So I think it's broadly positive. And it's, it's there's real some more clarity now about what's in and what's out. And, you know, it gives at least the taxpayers some idea of, of what, what sort of um, guidance to use and some clarity. Absolutely. Is that right? Absolutely, Anna. And uh, it's always best to follow HMRC's guidance in a sense focus on the principles that HMRC are using and they are looking effectively at direct link um, between the payment and the supply and if there's ever doubt you know always best to seek advice either from an advisor or seek a ruling from HMRC because these things can get complicated. Yeah. Often what happens is some taxpayers say, well, I'll take the easy way out and I'll just charge VAT and I've done the most prudent thing. But what it is effectively doing is that it's putting a risk on the person who is being charged VAT because if VAT shouldn't have been charged in the first place, then your customer would be penalized for recovering VAT. So it's effectively pushing the problem on to somebody else. So it's, it's still worth making sure that um, you follow the appropriate VAT treatment. Yeah. If we can move to the next slide, please. Making tax digital. So uh, hopefully um, you, you all would now be more familiar with these rules, which require businesses to file VAT returns using um, a bridging software. But these rules have also required businesses to make sure that they keep records um, in, in, in a digital format and they prepare VAT returns using specific digital links in their VAT returns. Now, these rules have usually applied to businesses who have a mandatory requirement to register for VAT. Um, but from, you'll see from 1st April, HMRC are now expanding the net and they're saying anybody who is um, who is VAT registered, doesn't matter whether you register mandatorily or voluntarily, you have to follow these rules. So if there's any doubt, again, just speak, speak with us because um, yeah, it is something HMRC are now looking at is checking whether businesses are following these rules. Um, next slide, please. Uncertain tax treatments, another huge topic. And I, and I see there is a lot of information on the slide, but I'll, I'll put it really simply. Effectively, again, 1st April 2022, this is the magic date. And HMRC have introduced these rules for large businesses. So think about turnover uh, for, your, for your group or for your company. So if it's in excess of 200 million, or if your balance sheet value is more than two, 2 billion as a group or just as a UK company, you could potentially fall under this net. And under these rules, all, all you have to do is if there is an uncertain tax treatment, you have to notify HMRC within certain uh, time limits. Uncertain tax treatment is defined to mean two things. Either you make a provision in your accounts to show that there could be an alternative tax treatment, 
or second that it's a tax treatment which goes against HMRC's publicly known position. Um, there is again a lot of questions around. Well, how do you, you know, how does provision practically work? Does it have to be at a group level? Does it have to be cumulative? Um, you know, these are all open questions which we are seeing. Um, you know, businesses ask, and we are we are working with them to work uh, their way through it. But effectively, again, if if there are any uncertain tax treatments, uh, particularly in returns that are due after 1st April 2022, they need to be notified. There is talk about HMRC introducing a new trigger for uncertain tax treatment, and that includes a situation where if if this matter was ever to go to court, will the court more likely to side with HMRC or the taxpayer. Um, this is not a formal trigger at the moment, but this is something HMRC is still considering introducing um, in the future. So we're keeping an eye on it. Um, but there are some exemptions. So particularly if you've already told HMRC of the problem or the issue, or you have given enough information for HMRC to do uh, for them to easily pick this up, this would potentially fall outside. And although this is sorry, Alita, you've been fading in and out a bit, but I can hear you most of the time. But that last point that you just said, would you just mind repeating that one? Absolutely. Thanks, Anna. So it effectively there are certain exclusions where you don't have to notify HMRC of the uncertain tax treatment. And this is particularly in situations where you have already disclosed the information to HMRC, um, either informally or in a form of a ruling, or, it, or where you have given, given enough information to HMRC for them to be aware that there is an uncertain tax treatment. So in that sort of situation, you don't have to, um, but otherwise the rules require you to. The other thing is that although this is a VAT update, um, this rule, these rules are more uh, expansive. So they don't only cover VAT, but they also co uh, cover corporate tax and partnership. So it's, uh, yeah, lots to think about, especially for a large business. Yeah, and there's a size limit, isn't there? So you talked about large businesses being 200 million on their P&L or you've got your balance sheet. Um, so turnover and balance sheet, two billion. Um, so, so let me just say that again. So 200 million turnover or two billion on your balance sheet. Yeah. Um, but there's is it a five million limit? I think that's on your slides um, in terms of the actual uncertainty itself. That's a very good point, Anna. That's the main thing. I forgot to mention it. Okay. Um, there is a threshold, yes. Um, so if your uncertain tax treatment is below five million, then you don't have to disclose it. But if it is an excess of that, then you have there is a legal requirement. And again, we are getting questions around how do you calculate the five million? Uh, do you calculate it over a year? Do you calculate it over several taxes? Um, or do you calculate it per uncertain tax treatment? So um, again, we're expecting more guidance from HMRC on all sorts of things around these rules, but it's worth businesses starting to think about what they have in place and how they can prepare when the rules do come in. Yeah, and as it's such a broad range that it affects the taxes, that actually it's thinking through what might fall into here. Um, even though we've got limited information, um, it's useful to understand, well, which areas would you want to sort of analyse further? Because obviously businesses are really complex, there's a lot going on. Um, so having clarity in your own mind about what might be affected by this is a useful exercise to go through. And personally, you know, I, I am hearing some clients thinking that this isn't particularly relevant to them, even if they meet the size thresholds. So there, there is something there. Um, and of course, this is new. And therefore, as you said, DT, they're already starting to think about other thresholds or other things that might triggers that might um, fall into this. So it's something that probably isn't going to go away and it's well worth getting your head around if you haven't already. And and absolutely, Anna, and these rules are not based on motive. So HMRC are not looking at, were you intending to break the rules or were you intending to do something 
sophisticated. They're, they're not looking at motive. It's very objective. Is there a tax advantage? Is it in excess of 5 million? Are you a large business? Bam, you have to tell it must be. Next slide, please. This is this is our final slide. So this is um, a concession that has been in place uh, with HMRC that HMRC were allowed for many years. HMRC have recently written to the Law Society to confirm that concession still applies. And effectively, it is in situations where um, a provider, particularly a solicitor, has incurred council fees. They can treat these council fees as disbursement for VAT purposes. So in that sort of situation, the solicitor simply has to forward the council fees invoice to the client, and the solicitor doesn't have to charge VAT on council fees. And you'll see from this line, there's a bit of guidance around how HMRC won council fees to be invoiced or addressed. But effectively, it's helping the ultimate client in a situation where they're not having to pay any extra VAT. They, they're, they're paying VAT straight on council's fees. The one thing to be mindful of is that if your client is overseas, then it's worth um, informing the council as well to make sure that because they are invoicing the ultimate client overseas, they shouldn't charge any VAT, of course. So there is a bit of making sure and coordinating with the council to make sure that the paperwork is done properly. And both council and the solicitor know the location of the customer. And uh, you, you'll see from the cases we've come so far. So we talked about Gray and Farah before Mandarin Consulting. All those sort of cases, again, help to identifying, are you providing consulting and where is your customer located? Um, I think this has been a quick whistle stop tour through a lot of feedback updates and we've, we've managed to cram it in, in time. Um, and Aditi, there are just a couple of questions, but one observation, I think, from everything that you've said is document and really think through everything. It's just like, you know, everything that you've said, it comes back to being really clear about why you've made a decision and Absolutely. also documenting the situation and the facts that you've based that decision on. 100%, Anna. And we see situations where a lot of times, if when we're particularly discussing a, a problem with a client, you, you just realize some of the problems could just go away if the documentation was proper. It actually, um, it actually showed what was actually going on in reality, and that was properly documented. That goes such a long way because that tends to be HMRC starting point as well to determine the VAT treatment. So they focus on the documentation and they will only look outside it if they are convinced the, con the contract or the documentation doesn't show what's going on in reality. And then there's a bit of hard work in convincing them actually the documentation is not proper. So that, that's where we see so many issues coming in. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, you've got to influence people to make sure that those documents are there. You know, if you're sitting in the finance team, it's not necessarily within your control. So there's an element of influencing to be done um, with various teams within your, your business. But there is actually um, just a, a couple of questions on VAT and reclaiming VAT that's come through. So the first question, um, very clear, which is in order to claim VAT on bad debts, do you need to actually write off the debt itself? 100%, yes. Um, it, there is a set of conditions under law that you need to satisfy as a taxpayer before you can make that claim. And one of them is um, writing off that bad debt. Um, the other, uh, thing to note is, I think, um, and I can see the question pop up on the screen as well. I think it says, should the debt be more than 12 months old? Uh, from memory, the time limit is actually more than six months old. Um, so, but you have to write off that debt in your account to make sure. Yeah, so providing for something isn't going to cut it, even if you've no. got 
a policy that you provide certain age debts in your in your accounts. No, understood. OK, um, the, Aditi, I think that's been enormously helpful. It certainly brushed up my VAT skills, which is, is, is always a good thing. Um, so I want to say thank you very much, and particularly because you stepped in at last minute. Um, as always, you know, really appreciative of the, the VAT support that our professional services firms receive. So thank you very much for doing that and stepping in here. Um, for our audience, I appreciate you tuning in. We will circulate the, the recording and the slides in the coming days. And as always, if you've got any views on what we should be covering here, anything in particular that you'd like to hear about on a future webinar, then please do let us know. You know, we're here, we're trying to address key issues that people are facing in the industry. Um, anything at the top of your agenda, let us know and we'll consider how we can weave it in. Thank you very much, everybody.